All right, so I shared my testimony with, uh, with you guys about a month ago. Um, this is kind of, just bear with me, this is going to be kind of difficult to explain. Cause, uh, so I shared my testimony four weeks ago, and uh, I explained what I was going through six months ago. So six months ago, just real quick for those of you who weren't here, I was addicted to cocaine. I was trafficking drugs to uh, New York and Kansas City. I was selling drugs out of my house, um, delivering drugs local here. My family left me. Um, I went to uh, a drug rehab and came home to divorce papers, in custody papers. And I uh, wasn't feeling too well, so I actually went to the doctor and found out I had a, actually had a heart attack from the cocaine. And then I was also um, thinking about suicide. So. On 5-7, I was saved here at this church, and um, the Lord really spoke to me um, that night, and I walked out of the chapel totally changed, and since then, um, I've been clean and sober, went to rehab, uh, no longer selling or trafficking. My family actually came home, and uh, the divorce... The divorce was canceled. Uh, we actually go into Marriage 101 now together. Um, and uh, actually, my wife is uh, more beautiful to me than ever now. And we get along a lot better than we ever have. Um, just, uh, just real quick, we've been together uh, almost eight years, married for two and a half. Um, after I found out I had a heart attack, um, I've been trying to take care of myself a little bit better. I went and had some blood work done and found out I'm totally healthy, um, good uh, blood pressure and everything. I don't think about suicide at all anymore. Instead, I uh, think about the Lord every minute of the day. We talk every day. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was when I came and spoke to you guys four weeks ago, I was still facing some serious charges. I was facing um, some trafficking charges in Texas when I got stopped with 150 pounds of dope. Uh, I was facing 20 years. And just so you guys, I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. Um, I, don't, I don't need to hide anything. So I ha I've already had two um, felony convictions from my past. So this would have been my third felony. And I was looking at 20 years um, on this and on top of that, I had some charges here in Nevada that I was looking at five years here in Nevada. So I started, the, started you know, I was still facing all this four weeks ago. And um, after I had left and shared my testimony, I got hit really hard. And I was having a really hard, you know, couple of weeks. And it went, I was preparing myself for that, you know, because the devil doesn't want me up here, you know. He, he's, uh, he doesn't want to let me go. And there's been nights that I've, got, I've came home and I've seen him waiting for me. And uh, he still wants me really bad, and, uh, but I, I just won't give in. And um, I actually, it, it's just pretty amazing what the Lord does. So anyhow, um, I'm trying to figure out how the best way to put this is. Um, I went to court here and actually um, saw the wrath of the judge. The judge was, was absolutely um, firm on me doing jail time. And we literally watched an attorney and a district attorney make a deal uh, on a, with another guy, another gentleman, we were watching him. And they had this deal worked out. Oh yes, this is gonna be good. They go up to the judge, they present, the ju present it to the judge and the judge is like, no way, you know, I'm not going to take this deal. Because ultimately, he has the decision. No matter what the district attorney or the attorney want to do, he has the ultimate decision. So they, they were saying, oh, he's going to do six months probation and a little fine. The judge said, no, he's going to do, uh, I think it was six months or a year in prison. And, um, and, I, and I, we watched that happen. And I was like, dang, you know, this judge is really serious. So I went up and the judge said, I don't even want to talk to you. You know, this is just an arraignment. You need to go get an attorney, come back. Um, so I did. Um, actually, I'm sorry. So we're, we're sitting in the courtroom and I get a message on my phone. 
and a guy drives by the courtroom, because let me, let me tell you, this isn't a small town up north, this isn't Las Vegas, this is north, a couple hours. So a guy drives by the courtroom, sees my truck outside, and messages me, he says, hey, um, you're here in town? I said, yeah, I said, I have court. And I said, uh, he said, well, I know the judge really well, he should be in a good mood because we actually went fishing together last weekend and he caught some good fish. And I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking this is really weird because I don't know this guy too well. And he's, uh, he says, stop by my shop when you get done. I want to talk to you. I said, okay. So I leave the courtroom and I'm, you know, at first I'm really happy because I think there's, you know, there's a chance that everything's going to be good. And then after I talk to the judge, the judge is, uh, you know, just tells me basically get out of here. I don't want to see you until you get an attorney. So I leave with my head down, and I go see this guy that sent me this message uh, through Facebook. And I stop in his shop, and he says, um, hey, I've I seen you've changed your life and been following you on Facebook and seeing all the pictures of you at the church and doing this and that. He said, uh, I'm going to talk to the judge for you. And by the way, here's a paper to an attorney that's the judge's best friend. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I, I get this paper, and I call the attorney, and I, I give him the money, and I don't hear from him, you know, at all. I'm like, man, what's going on? My court date's coming up. And it was like the day before I talked to, I talked to the attorney. He says, well, I don't really know what's going to happen, and, uh, you know, we haven't talked to the judge yet. So I go to court the next day, and um, I'm sitting there, and I'm nervous. And... Let me just tell you that during this whole time, this whole month, I was just praying like crazy on my knees and, and reading and serving and doing all I could, you know, to, to just follow the Lord. And um, so I go to court, and I'm supposed to do five years. Like, there's, there's no way out of this. And the judge talks to the DA, talks to the attorney, and, and they just drop the whole case. Um, <laughs> And within five days of that, I get a phone call from Texas for my 20-year sentence, and they tell me, your charges are dismissed. Yeah. So, <laughs> obviously the Lord has some plans. Um, so this all happened to me just uh, a couple weeks ago. So now all my criminal past is just gone. I was looking at 20, you know, 20 years in Texas, five years here. The Lord did all of that. You know, I, there was no way out of this at all. Um, so I just wanted to share. That was an update that I was asked to share. And then I wanted to share one other thing with you guys, too. Um, so before I went to rehab, I flew to Denver, and... I went to a, a tattoo shop because I was supposed to go to rehab the next day, and, and I'm really nervous, and they wouldn't accept me unless I, you know, I was clean and sober, so you know, I, I did that part, and then I went to the tattoo shop because I was just so nervous, and I, and I got my save date tattooed on my hand. It says, in God we trust, and it has the 5716, and I just, it was just special to me because it was my save date, you know, and... The next morning I go to rehab, and it's like almost like a boot camp rehab. It was really crazy. And I actually, I'm, I'm a, I got an email today actually from the, the rehab uh, center asking me if I'd come back and um, be a, a staff with them. So <laughs> that's really, it was pretty crazy to get that today. But um, so the last day of rehab, we're, we're laying hands on a brother, and he's just, he's torn to pieces. His family's leaving him. He's going through divorce. Um, alcohol addiction, all sorts of things, and, and my hand's on him. And one of the elders sees my hand, sees the date on my hand, and the next day when we're saying goodbye to everybody, he asked me to stand up, and he says, hey, um, I saw your hand. He said, I just want to share something with you real quick. He said, the Lord, you know, wanted, he put this on my heart, and I need to share it with you. I said, okay. So I stood up, and all, all these men are in the, in the room. And he said, so you see the we, you know, 5, 7, 16, he said, the E is for Ephesians, chapter 5, 7, through, verses 7 through 16. And I don't have my Bible, I don't have it memorized, but the, 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 the verse that sticks with me 
in Ephesians chapter 5, 7 through 16, it says you were once darkness and now you're light in the Lord. And that's just who I am now. And, uh, you know, the conviction on me is um, huge. Um, you know, I just, I just want to be a light, and I just encourage all of you guys to be a light in, in anything that you do at your work place, uh, here at the church, on your street, at the grocery store. Just be a reflection of the Lord. Be a light. Um, that's all I want to do now, and, and the Lord has just blessed me so much with, in, in, in me doing that. So I just want to say thank you guys, and have, have a great night. And here's Brandon. Take, take awesome. For those of you guys that don't know, uh, from the moment that uh, newly got saved, me and him became like really good friends, so we hang out a lot. <laughs> I happen to be at that, at that uh, well, both, both, both court dates, and uh, so we kind of looked at each other when we saw, you know, the when we saw the hammer come down, we were like, oh, man, this is not going to be good. And then uh, when, when I was there the second time around and saw God just completely reverse that, it was, uh, I sent him a little meme in court. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I do want to say this, right as, right as we're opening. Actually, um, I had a dream last night. I, you know, I don't know if it's from the Lord or, or just excitement or what. Uh, I definitely rejoiced in the Lord. But I had a dream last night. I was just sharing with him today that uh, kind of a scenario, same scenario. We were sitting in court, but it was more like a cafeteria room, and the judge was sitting at like a fold-out table. It was really weird. Um, and, uh, but, but he was in handcuffs, and, and he was in his prison suit, and, uh, and we were just waiting to see, you know, if he was going to get... Uh, arraigned of what was going to happen, and, um, and, uh, and the judge said not guilty, and he picked up this piece of paper, but I, I couldn't tell in my dream. I was like, I think that's what he said. Is that what he said? And then Newly looks at me with, and this is all in my dream, guys, so. <laughs> <laughs> and then Newly picks up this piece of paper that says not guilty on it, and we, and we both just like, oh, dude, can't believe this happened. This is awesome. <laughs> and then I woke up, and I was like, dude, but that really did happen. Oh. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm just saying that to say that it's a beautiful picture of what happens in Christ. We are guilty. We have done, uh, we have rebelled against God's kingdom, and yet God is so merciful that he hands us a slip that says, not guilty. Somebody else paid your fine, and that person who laid down their life in order to preserve our life is Jesus Christ. And so what Newly shared was just a physical example of a spiritual reality. I'm going to say that again. What he just shared was a physical example, God setting him free of a spiritual reality. A lot of times in life, we sin, we come to Christ, and there's still consequences to be paid. Uh, and whether God lets us off the hook or not, here's what we do know, that in Christ, he who is in Christ is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. There is no condemnation, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So even if you're still paying for your sin and God hasn't let you off the hook just yet, that doesn't mean that in Christ you haven't already been forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen. I've already begun preaching, and we haven't even got to the message yet. So if you would, open up your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8. I know you may be thinking, uh, I thought we were in Proverbs chapter 7. We're going to skip Proverbs chapter 7 per Pastor Derek uh, because Proverbs chapter 7 deals mainly with adultery. And, uh, and we covered that, I believe, in Proverbs chapter 5. So we are going to move on to Proverbs chapter 8. The title of my message tonight is The Nature of Wisdom. The nature of wisdom. So I'm just going to read kind of in sections. I'll start off with Proverbs 8, 1 through 11. And point number one, there's four points tonight. Point number one, so we're going to talk about the, the, the different attributes, if you will, or the nature of wisdom. Uh, and so one of the attributes of wisdom is that wisdom cries out. Proverbs 8.1, Do not, does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? 
She takes her stand on the top of the high hill beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the door. She cries out, excuse me, uh, verse four, to you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things. For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are with, right, uh, the, with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Receive instruction and not silver. And knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies and all things one may desire cannot be compared with her. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for tonight. Father, I personally ask for your help. There's some very deep truths that uh, we're going to be covering tonight, Lord. And uh, if I just can be transparent before you and before your people, some of these truths are even uh, beyond my own understanding. So God, I just pray that you would help us uh, to minister your word, to understand your word, and to live by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The nature of wisdom is that it cries out. I think that's important to understand in a generation that we live in where we're no longer, a lot of us, and I can even uh, say this as an evangelist, I get to a place where I see how people have abused the gospel. I see how the wrong people always seem to have the mic, right? It's like when the news people show up, uh, they find the one guy that knows nothing, who thinks he knows everything, and they shove the microphone in his face. Oh, yeah, and look for the one guy who calls himself a Christian and knows nothing but claims to know everything. And, and the news media just loves to highlight that guy, don't they? And so with that being said, I think sometimes... Uh, when given the opportunity to cry out, which is really every day, every moment, there's, there's an opportunity to be a witness, to be a voice. Uh, we say to ourselves, we can be prone to say to ourselves, I, but I don't want to be like that guy. I mean, that guy put a bad reputation, a bad taste in people's mouths about Christians, and I don't want to do what he did. And so we tend to, we can tend to uh, have the temptation to really say, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to quietly, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just, when God opens up the door, then that's when I'll walk through, right? But that's not the nature of wisdom. Wisdom cries out. It stands in the highways and the byways, in the middle of the city, as, as, or, or, uh, or before people even enter into the city, and it stands at the gates, and it cries out. John the Baptist was one who cried out. In John 1, it, verse uh, 22, they asked John the Baptist, what do you say about yourself? And he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make a straight way for the Lord. Uh, Jesus told the disciples that uh, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. I think, it's, I think it's necessary that in the day and age that we're living in, that we have people that are unashamed of the gospel. That they're unashamed to cry out the wisdom of God. How about Jesus himself? I mean, let's think about it in, real, in all reality. If you were to think about the nature of wisdom before uh, you read Proverbs chapter 8, I would kind of tend to think that nature was kind of, uh, that the nature of wisdom, it, it was kind of quiet and, and it was calm and it was well kept. And, and I think wisdom has its place. For the Bible says that uh, a, a, a fool um, expels all of his heart. Right. That even uh, a, a fool is thought to be wise when he shuts his mouth. Ooh. <laughs> even a fool is thought to be wise when he shuts his mouth. So there's 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 reason to believe that wisdom is kind of uh, quiet kept. But uh, in, in essence, the nature of wisdom is that it, it cries out. And so do we see that in the life of Jesus, who really is the embodiment of wisdom? And absolutely we do. G uh, 
John 18, 19, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. He said, tell me, what, what is this you've been teaching? And Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask of those who have heard me and what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I've said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, then why do you strike me? Jeremiah testifies unto the nature of wisdom. For Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9 says, Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach, and a derision daily, in other words, because uh, God's word brought persecution, he said, uh, then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Before I read the rest of that, has anybody ever felt like that? That you've spoken on God's behalf, and by speaking on God's behalf, by declaring wisdom, you, you got made to be the fool. And you just said to yourself, you know what, I'm not, God, I am never speaking on your behalf again. <laughs> and I mean, let's be real, right? Anybody ever felt that way? That, fine, fine, Lord. I don't need to go through this, right? But if you're truly born again, if the Spirit of God truly lives within you, here, here's what happened next. And Jeremiah goes on to say, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back. I could not. That God's word, his, his wisdom is so valuable, so precious that even when uh, I find his word a burdensome to preach, I can't hold it in because it's like fire in my bones. I got to tell somebody. Does anybody, can I, uh, let me just ask another question. Do you ever... Uh, do you ever just have a desire to go witness to somebody? Like, dude, I just, I'm, I'm just going to go tell somebody about Jesus. Some, somebody got to know about Jesus. If you don't ever have that desire, it's probably, and, and I'm not saying this to shame anybody. I'm just being real about it. If you don't have this desire, it's probably because you, 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 your, your, your eye view, uh, your mind's view, your heart view is really limited to how awesome he is. Because when you really start getting a grasp of how, how merciful he's been to you and how, and how good he's been to you. And I, I know even as I'm saying this, there's some people right now going, but you don't know what I'm going through. And uh, everything's probably just dandy for you. And you don't, you don't know my life. Can I just say that? <laughs> but I, I can say that as much hell as I've been through, God has been, he's been good. He's been good. He's been good. And sometimes you just get to the point where he's like so, you know, I can't hold it in anymore. I got to tell somebody. I feel bad for the first person that's outside of my door when I walk outside of my house because he's going to hear about Jesus. <laughs> it does happen, too, by the way. And my prayer is, God, make it happen more. Hey, I'm looking at, hang, give me one second. I'm looking at my notes. Something just happened right now. Give me one second. <laughs> Lord, help me. Thank you. Somehow, I had a bunch of notes get inserted into my notes. So hopefully, hopefully I'm preaching the right message. Let's, uh. So far, so good. <laughs> See, this is Proverbs chapter 8, right? Let me. <laughs> we should not never feel guilty for sharing the gospel. Uh, I'm just going to share this. You guys know me by now. I don't, I, I don't mind being uh, transparent. Neither does Pastor Derek. Uh, neither do the rest of the pastors on staff. That's one of the reasons I just love our church. It's just real people who just love a real God, and we just keep it real, right? Um, 
So when I first, one of the ways that I met Pastor Derek is he had brought me out to do an event. Well, I'm just going to be honest. Like, I'll preach in front of 100 people. I'll preach in front of uh, uh, 10 people. I'll go into prisons. I'll stand before murderers and killers. I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my passion. That's my addiction. I, I, I live for that, right? Uh, what I de- necessarily don't like doing is talking to somebody that doesn't want to hear it. Like, people that are walking by, uh, God's really had to, especially in this last year, just kind of uh, reignite a passion for evangelism, regardless of the cost, regardless of the convenience. And uh, so here's my story. Uh, Pastor Derek had brought me out here to, uh, this is a true story, and I, and I think I told him this, and if not, then when he hears it uh, on the playback, or if he's at home, he's hearing it now for the first time. Uh, Pastor Derek, be merciful on me. <laughs> um, but what happened was, he had brought me out to UNLV to preach, and so there's a, 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 a speaker and a microphone, and, and the students are walking by to the classroom. And I'm not going to lie, like, I was like, man, this is embarrassing. <laughs> and a true story, this really, this really happened. So I sit down next to a friend of mine, and I just start complaining. I'm like, man, this is, I mean, you know, it's like open air preaching, like, do we, is this is really necessary, and... Don't judge me. Don't judge me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I even went as far as to say, you know, has, has anybody ever got, you know, saved? Just, you know, somebody preaching on the strip and well, everyone's walking by doing their thing. And so, you know, I was just kind of venting and complaining. And as I'm complaining, this guy walks up to the table, a UNLV student, and he interrupts me and my friend as I'm complaining. And he says, hey, I, I just want to let you know I, um, I was walking by for my class and I heard you kind of sharing your story and about Jesus. And I used to go to church and I've kind of fallen away. And I just want to thank you, man. You're, uh, just thank you for being bold. Thank you for standing out here. I, I needed to hear that today. And as, you know, as he's like blessing me, I'm feeling horrible, right? Like just more, <laughs> more and more like, oh, Lord, I suck. Help me. Um, God is merciful. God is good. But it's stuff like that, and it's, and it's Proverbs chapter 8 that reminds me, this is the nature of wisdom. Wisdom cries out. There's absolutely nothing wrong with standing in somebody's way, no matter how convenient it may sound, and sharing with them wisdom. There's absolutely nothing wrong if a friend is in the midst of adultery, and they call themselves a Christian to make them accountable to the word of God. No matter how inconvenient it may feel at the time, you and I need to remember that the very nature of wisdom is that it cries out, it's stands before the city, before people enter, and it says, lo and behold, this is the way. Walk in it. And so if wisdom dwells within us, then we ought to be imitating that crying out. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number two is that wisdom, so the nature of wisdom is that it cries out, number one. Number two, uh, the, taken from Proverbs chapter eight, I'm sure there's a whole lot more, but what I see here is that uh, wisdom blesses its possessor. The nature of wisdom is that it blesses those who possess it. Verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. If you remember a few weeks ago, maybe even when it was last week, Pastor Derek had made the comment, uh, whenever you see something that God hates, we ought to take notice of it. And then we ought to examine ourselves. And so I just wanted to highlight that. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. We live in a time where uh, we love to say love wins, love wins. And we use that phrase love wins to justify homosexuality. We use that phrase love wins to justify anything that seems convenient. Let's not step on anybody's toes because love wins. Just just allow people to live their lives as long as they're loving, they're living. And then we go as far as to say because God is love and God is love and love hates. Love hates evil. Love hates evil. 
Wisdom blesses its possessor by giving it the ability, the person, the ability to perceive evil and hate it. This is a blessing that comes from wisdom. When, when somebody receives wisdom, a byproduct of receiving wisdom is a hatred for what is evil. A heart that lacks wisdom is a heart that has not learned to hate wickedness. Oftentimes, an immature heart or a heart that's not filled with wisdom can ask a question like this. And I'm not saying that necessarily all the time this question is asked by somebody who doesn't have wisdom. Maybe they're still trying to conceptualize what they've already has been revealed in their heart. That, that can happen, right? God reveals something in your heart, but you necessarily can't fathom what it is that you're feeling or sensing. That, I mean, being born again is that way. I mean, I got born again and all of a sudden didn't realize why I was hating the things that I thought I loved. Well, wait a minute. I thought I loved that. Why am I, why am I hating that now? Does, if you're not born again, that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> if you're born again, I mean, if you're filled with the, with the Spirit of God, which, by the way, if you're a Christian, the only qualification for you being a Christian is that you repented of your sins and the evidence that God has received your repentance is that he has filled you with his Holy Spirit. And for me, and I think for all of us, according to Scripture, for 1 John says that he who has been born again uh, cannot sin because the seed of God abides in him. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean as Christians we never sin? No, that's not what that means. But what it means is that our hearts are so filled with the love of God that we can no longer enjoy wickedness. It's impossible. We may do wickedness, but even the things that we do, we now hate. That was my confusion as a Christian. I was doing the things that I thought I loved, only while I was doing them, I was hating what I was doing. I was like, what's going on here? I don't know if I've told this story, but I've already started, so I'm just going to share it. I was, watching, I was watching the movie Friday, and uh, Chris, if, uh, if you don't know the movie, it's all about smoking weed. And Chris Tucker in the movie uh, says these two words, GD, God, you know, you can fill in the blank. And I used to watch this movie all the time. I watched it all the time. It was my favorite movie. I knew every single word. Now, at this point, I had been born again, but I didn't really realize it. I got filled with the Holy Spirit and didn't realize it yet. My first epiphany was this. I was watching Friday, and Chris Tucker says the GD word. And as he says it, my heart goes, that's my, that's my dad he's talking about. That's my heavenly father. Why, why do you use his name like that? Now, mind you, I probably just said that word a few days ago. <laughs> right? I'm just, just being real. I used to say, you know, Jesus Christ, but not in a, you know, not, not in, a, in worship. I said it as a, as a cuss word. I said his name in vain. And now I'm listening to my, I'm watching my favorite movie, and it was like a movie that I was trying to love, I was hating. And it was literally to the point where I'm trying to figure out what's going on with me. Why am I, why am I crying right now? <laughs> like... So, I mean, really, and that would happen too, right? Worship would happen before you stood in worship. You're like, what's everybody, right? Like, if you're new today and you see everybody, like, you know? And I'm going to just be real. Like, you know, this church is, you know, we're moving in worship, and it's awesome, but uh, I've been to some churches where people just let loose. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and that, was, that was weird for me. And then all of a sudden, as I'm born again, but, you know, still trying to conceptualize what God has already done in my spirit, you know, uh, the preacher's preaching and I'm crying. I'm going, well, what am I crying for? <laughs> what, what's happening to me? Well, what's happened is that God had got a hold of my heart. That's what happened. And if God's got a hold of your heart, wisdom is dwelling in you. God's wisdom and wisdom is teaching you to hate what is evil. If you love wisdom, the benefit of loving wisdom is that wickedness will not deceive you. John 3, 19 says this, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So there's this, there's this uh, thing happening, which is when I love evil, I run from wisdom. Because wisdom will expose my wickedness. And I'm in love with wickedness. I got this relationship with wickedness. And so I don't want anything to put me on blast. But when I love wisdom, I learn to hate what is wicked. Verse 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. Matthew Henry says uh, they reign by him. All justice is decreed by the wisdom of God. That's a profound thought. All justice that takes place on the earth is decreed and given by God. They reign by him and therefore ought to reign for him. Whatever qualifications for government, any kings or princes have their indebted. What, uh, excuse, let me say that again. Whatever qualifications for government, any kings or princes have, they are indebted to the grace of Christ for them. He gives them the spirit of government and they have nothing, no skill, no principles of justice, but what he endues them with. Psalms 2 makes a plea to the kings of the earth, and it says this, Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. This, this weekend we had General uh, Boykin come and speak at the men's conference. How many men came? Tell me, what, was, it, was it not off the chain? Was it, yeah. that means dope. Was it not dope? I mean, sorry, was it not cool? Was that, well, it, was, it was cool. All right. Uh, General Boykin displayed what it's like for the kings and rulers to submit to the wisdom of God. And he shared about how going into some very severe circumstances, leading his men uh, as the commander, he would pray, he would bow his head and he would pray. And then he began to share how God would deliver him and his men. And I just began to think about how awesome it is when the rulers of our country humble themselves to bow to the wisdom of God. Verse 17, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I traverse the way of righteousness. In other words, I'm in the way of righteousness. Where righteousness is, there I am also, if I could put it that way. In the midst of the path of justice, that it may cause those who love me to inherit wealth that I, might, that I may fill their treasuries. Wisdom is better than rubies, not because it is only able to bring financial wealth, but even when by it one suffers, he has recompensed eternal rewards that are far greater. Number three, wisdom comes from God. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. So, so wisdom is being personified. It's being spoken of in the form of a person. Uh, ladies, you'll like the fact that it's personified as a she, right? Uh, Pastor Derek, uh, when he was giving me, uh, you know, kind of what to, you know, what to, to speak on. He said, you know, uh, uh, study, research, why it's referred to as a she. Uh, after a while, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't come up with, uh, you know, some, some really solid commentary. So we'll just leave it at the fact that, uh, that wisdom is referred to as a she. And ladies, you, you can enjoy that, okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll just... <laughs> I said, I said, Pastor Derek, maybe... maybe uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm qualified to preach this message. Um, <laughs> 
The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. I've been established from everlasting from the beginning before there was ever an earth. When there was no depths, I was brought forth when there were no fountains abounding with water. This is a, an amazing thought. And this is where I really, you know, I struggled uh, preparing for this. I'm just going to be honest with you uh, because it's speaking about wisdom. As God says, before I created the world, I created Wisdom. I, I, I made wisdom. Everything that wisdom is, I made it and then used it to create the world. What? That's that is amazing. Now, some people would say uh, that uh, with a little bit of credibility, they would say that uh, Proverbs chapter eight is referring to Christ. And the reason that they would say that is because, number one, Christ is the embodiment of wisdom. Well, I would agree with that. Uh, number two, the Bible says that nothing that was made was made without him. In other words, when God created the world and the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God in the beginning, the word was with God, right? There was God, there was the word, he spoke the world into existence and Christ was with God in the beginning. Christ is the word of God. Uh, the Bible says that without Christ, there's nothing that was made that was made. Everything that was made was made through Christ. So there's another reason to possibly assume that when it's talking about wisdom, God's saying, I, I, I formed wisdom before the world began and I used wisdom to create the world. And we know that Christ created the world. So Christ must be what it's referring to in Proverbs chapter 8, well, you're probably noticing with me that there's another question mark that's got to come up. It says that uh, I was brought forth. Well, Christ refers to himself in Revelations. I am the beginning and the end. I am the alpha and omega. That there, that there is no uh, Christ being brought forth or created by God, but Christ uh, is God and he was with God in the beginning. From everlasting to everlasting, Christ was. If you have no idea what I'm saying, let me just say this. Christ is God. Amen. Amen. Furthermore, Jehovah's Witnesses will use this verse to try to convince people that Christ was created. So let me just demolish that argument with one scripture. I had a whole bunch and I really had to narrow it down because it just wasn't time. I was like, let me get him, Lord. Let me get him. No. Um, <laughs> Matthew chapter 22. For me, this ends all arguments right here. Matthew, you can turn here. I'm going to stay here for just a second. Matthew chapter 22, verse 41. says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ? The Messiah. That's what Christ means. What, what do you think about the Messiah? So they're waiting on the Messiah. They believe in the Messiah because of the Old Testament scriptures. And so they say, and so Christ knows that. And so he says, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Is it 21? Matthew 22, 21. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you sure? 22. Yeah, that's what, that's what I said. Isn't that not what I said? Okay. All right. Matthew chapter 22, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the, the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. Well, why the son of David? Because in the scriptures, it's declared that uh, the Messiah will come from David's lineage, from his offspring. Well, Christ did come from the lineage of David. So Jesus is asking them a reasonable question. Whose son is he? Well, they responded with a reasonable answer. He said to them, they, they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? And now Jesus quotes the Old Testament scripture and he says, the Lord said to my Lord, this is David speaking, the Lord said to my Lord, that's the Lord God, said to my Lord, Jesus Christ. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? 
And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare to question him anymore. In other words, if you're new to Scripture and that was really confusing, let me just say it like this. Jesus is simply asking the question. If all the Messiah is, is simply a person that comes from the lineage of David, So David, looking forward prophetically into the future, knows that the Messiah is going to be born from his bloodline because God promised him that. Then how is it that in that same moment, looking forward, he also looks up and calls the Messiah Lord? In other words, he cannot just be a person. He must also be God. And somebody says, amen. Amen. Woo! Come on, somebody. The Lord must help me on that one because I would have jacked it up. (laughs) Verse 25, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world. I'm going to skip some of my notes or or we're going to run out of time here. Um. No, I'm not. I'm going to read this. Uh, Psalms 103 says this. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. Ooh. So, so, so God sometimes, in all of his infinite wisdom, looks at us, watches us make stupid mistakes, and he has to remember, okay, <laughs> I made him out of dust. We're dust. We're dust. For he knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it's gone. Its place remembers it no more. Verse 27. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. This is wisdom speaking. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Can you can you imagine that? So. Let me keep reading and then and then make this point. Uh, Verse 28. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit. So the waters would not transgress his command when he marked out the foundations of the earth. What? God marks out the foundations of the earth. In Job 38, he says it like this. He, uh, Job is beginning to get prideful. He's questioning God. And God says, hold up, Job. Oh, man of dust. Let me ask you a question. Where were you? Right? And he goes on to say, or, or who shut the sea with doors, when it burst forth and issued uh, from the womb, when I made the clouds its garments and a thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no further, and here your proud waves must hold. In my terminology, I would say that's gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that may be inappropriate for somebody, but I... But the, but the Lord looks at the oceans and says, hey, you're to go this far and no further. Your proud waves must hold. Drop the mic, I'm out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's how I would have done it. He is so wise, I want to just bring up one other point on God's wisdom. He is so wise that in creating the earth, this is back in Job verse uh, uh, chapter 39, he actually brags about making dumb things. I'm not playing. Read this, watch this. Uh, Job 39 verse 13, he said, look, watch this, the wings of an ostrich. They, they wave proudly. It's the Bible. I'm not making this up. And it's the New King James Version, all right? So it's not some wacky version. Check this out. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like uh, the kindly storks? For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them 
or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern. He's like, look at, look, and all of my wisdom, look, look, hey, look how I did the ostrich though. <laughs> that thing is dumb. <laughs> but check this out. But then he says this, because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. Now watch this, verse 18. And when she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. As dumb as I made it, put it up against the horse. Now, anybody have any idea how fast a horse runs? Okay, well, I don't know what kind of horse you looked up. <laughs> Mind you, it's on a rider. And these are horses before they, were, uh, before they were inbred to run. Okay? The average horse, according to Wikipedia, runs 25 to 30 miles an hour. An ostrich runs, uh, excuse, 25, does that what I said? 25 to 30 miles an hour? An ostrich runs 40 to 45 miles an hour. The Bible is right again. This was written how long ago? Right? 28. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Verse 30. Then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. There's an interesting thought. I'll just say this and move on, but uh, wisdom delights to share uh, herself with men, meaning that she, uh, she finds joy in God's creation, and she stands and cries out, seek me, seek me. Here's the last point, and I'll close here. Wisdom, the nature of wisdom is that it is the way of life. Verse 32, now therefore listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. By the way, Pastor Derek uh, has been teaching us uh, very purposefully that the word blessed means what? Happy. The word blessed means Happy, for happy are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my post, the post of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. All those who hate me love uh, death. Not, not loving God is loving wickedness, right? I mean, when somebody says to you, well, you know, I mean, I'm just not, uh, I just don't express my love for God like that. I just don't like the Bible like that. I just don't worship like that. I mean, you, 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 you know, you're just built a little differently. Now, granted, some of us are built a little differently, but I'm talking about the spirit of God, the desire for wisdom that God has placed within our hearts if we're born again. To not have that is to not just be built differently. To not have that is to love wickedness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one, don't, don't turn there, I'm just going to read it uh, for the sake of time. The coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. It's talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to deceive many. He's going to deceive those who are perishing. That means they're dying. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. How are we saved? We're saved by loving the truth. 
And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They did not believe the truth. Why? Because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. To not love the truth is to love wickedness. So, in conclusion, how does wisdom operate today? What, is, what, is, what, is it, what does wisdom look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, here's, here's what wisdom looks like. Number one, wisdom waits for the coming of Christ. If you are filled with wisdom, here's what your life looks like. You are waiting for the coming of Christ. Matthew 24, 45. I know I've read a lot of scriptures, but you're not mad at that, right? This is a Bible-believing church. Matthew 20, 40, uh, 24, 45 says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying in his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and an hour he is not aware of. And he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What makes a wise servant? How does wisdom respond now? It waits. It is always waiting. It's always looking for the coming of Christ. And number two, wisdom builds its life on Christ. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. And what did that wise man do? He built his house on the rock. That's the word of God. He, on, on God's wisdom, he builds his life. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock, the wisdom of God, Christ, the gospel. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Amen? Amen. 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 Let me just say this for those who may be visiting today. This is the gospel. The gospel is that you and I have sinned. Uh, let me define sin. Sin is not just, oops, I, I, I messed up. The world loves that. They love to say, I, I, I made a mistake. Um, but what they'll never say is, I love wickedness. If we're going to define sin, we're not talking about making a mistake. We're talking about habitually making a mistake, which means you do it on purpose because you love wickedness. Now, don't get offended when I say that. Well, maybe you should. But uh, let me just preference that by saying all of us at some point loved wickedness and we hated wisdom. We hated God because God offered us a way out of our wickedness, but we loved our wickedness and did not want a way out until one day faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What does that mean? That means one day we heard the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is that God loves you right in your wickedness. It doesn't matter if you're involved in homosexuality. It doesn't matter if you're drug addicted. It doesn't matter if you are addicted to pornography. It doesn't matter if you've been abusive to your spouse. It doesn't matter if you are filled with anger and unforgiveness and bitterness and you have, uh, you're filled with wrath and rage. God will love you right where you're at. In fact, the Bible says that he loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you while you were still a sinner. Let me, let me preference that. Jesus didn't die for you because he foresaw that one day you would seek him. That's not, that's not how he died for you. He died for you knowing that you would never seek him without his guidance and his prodding and the help of his Holy Spirit. So he died for you and I while we were still clinging and loving wickedness. And this is how the love of God is manifest. This is how we know what love looks like. That he died for us while we we're clinging to sin. 
He stands before the gates of hell, the grave, and before the heavens, and before man, and he says, and God says, I'm going to take your wickedness, and I'm going to place it on my son, and he's going to die on your behalf. Your punishment that you deserve for loving wickedness, he's going to take the punishment. I heard a pastor say it like this. If anybody goes to hell, they would literally have to crawl over the body of Jesus. Think about that for a second. Jesus is standing before the gates of hell, bleeding, and you have to crawl over his body in order to get there. Nobody is going to accidentally end up in hell. You're going to have to crawl over a praying mother. You're going to have to crawl over a praying sibling. You're going to have to crawl over preachers who are pleading and prodding with you to, to enjoy the eternal life that God offers you by sending his son to die on the cross. You're going to have to crawl over all creation that testifies that there is a God. Nobody is going to get to hell without crawling over the body of Jesus. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you, but he didn't just die for you. It took me a long time to understand this. So simple, but it took me a long time to understand this. I used to think, well, if I'm forgiven because Christ died, what does it matter that he resurrected? That he resurrected? That's a reasonable question, right? If, if Christ died and I'm forgiven, he paid my penalty, then what does it matter that he resurrected? And then I began to read the scriptures that say uh, that now we have an advocate before the Father. Right? Meaning that not only did Christ die for my sins, but now he uh, stands before the Father and presents his blood, if you will, and, 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 and is always praying on my behalf. He, he's always standing and bearing witness that I've been forgiven. As long as Jesus Christ is alive, think about this for a second, then there's always a testimony to God. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Do you realize what that means? That at the right hand of God, there is a testimony there for all of eternity that I have been forgiven. If Christ doesn't stand at the right hand of God, then who will testify on my behalf that his blood has been shed? But Christ himself is there, living, alive testifying to the Father, always in my stead, in my place, that I've been forgiven. And the Holy Spirit is with us on the earth. And so this is the gospel message, that if you would believe that, that just as God raised his son from the dead, by that same power and that same authority that he has to come back, to come back from the grave, he'll give that to you. You're in, you're in wickedness? You love, you love wickedness? Well, here's a way out. God will fill you with his spirit. He'll fill you with his wisdom and enable you in and outside of yourself by the power of his spirit. He's going to enable you to hate wickedness. Some of us need that. Because we're like, man, I, if I'm going to be honest, I, I love wickedness, right? And I'm, this is not what I'm saying. This is what I would have said then. I love wickedness. Can, can God help me to hate it? Because if I could just hate it, that would help out a whole lot. <laughs> if I could hate the things I'm doing, then I probably would stop doing them. That's what happens when you're born again. Amen. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead comes to dwell inside of you, and he gives you the power to love wisdom and to hate wickedness. I think right now is a beautiful time for an altar call. Amen? <laughs> this is what happened when I gave my life to Jesus. If you are, if you're sitting here, I want to make this like just, you know, I just feel like it's kind of a real moment right now. I have these moments every once in a while. You know, it just gets real. This is just a real moment. Listen, if, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're maybe a professed Christian or um, maybe you're not a professed Christian, but whatever you, whatever you title yourself, you can honestly say, uh, I don't think, I don't know that I have the Holy Spirit living in me like that. Um, I, I, I want the Holy Spirit to live in me like that. I know that, I've, I, know that I sin, and I don't want to keep sinning. I want God to forgive me. I want him to fill me with his Holy Spirit. I want me, him to fill me with wisdom. If, if, if that's you, there's, there's nobody on stage. There's no music playing, just a real moment. If, if that's you, can I ask you to, to stand up, and we're, we're, we're going to pray for you? No, real talk. There's something. You, come on. Come on.
Jesus said, if you'll not be ashamed of me before men, I will not be ashamed of you before my Father. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray. And, I'm gonna, and, and while we're praying, if you feel led to just stand up. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Proverbs chapter 8. God, I thank you for just uh, your help tonight. Father, we honor you. We bless you. God, we know that in all the world there is none like you. There's no one who holds the power that you hold. There's no one who loves like you love. There's no one who is able to save like you save. And for that, we honor you. God, if there's any sin in our lives, we ask that you would uh, forgive us of our sin. We ask that you would empower us to uh, walk in your ways, to seek after wisdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Listen, I know I, know I asked you to, to stand up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one, one better. Uh, if you feel God tugging on your heart, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to just make your way down here. If you feel God tugging on your heart, I'm going to ask you to make your way down here. God wants to bless you. And we're just going to pray for you. Hey, listen, guys, this is only as awkward as we make it. All right? If God's, if God's tugging on your heart, be a man, be a woman, and respond to his voice. Matter of fact, let me rephrase that. Be a daughter. Be a son. Respond to his voice. Father, we bless your name. We love you. We thank you for this night. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. She's precious. Anybody else? The Bible says no man has promised tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. That's, a, that's an important scripture for me because uh, some people say, I'll just wait till God shows me. But his word says very clearly, today's the day. Wait no further. We're going to pray with those that are up here. If you feel led by the Spirit to, to make your way up here, there's no, no interruption, nothing weird. Just make your way up here. It's all good. Um, for those of you guys that are standing up here, if you would just pray with me, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. Um, just repeat after me. God, I know that I've sinned. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I want to know the love that you have for me. I thank you for your son who died on the cross. And I believe three days later he rose again. Empowered by your spirit. And so I ask that that same spirit would empower me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God is good. God bless you guys. If we could, everybody, if you'd stand and we'll worship the Lord together.